my knees would be black and blue because he beat me so badly I couldn't turn over. And this happened uh, on a regular basis. My wife, who was my first girlfriend in seventh grade, and she knew my dad, was like, how many times do you remember him doing this? And it was probably at least two or three times a week. And, um, and it wasn't until uh, my freshman year in high school, my, when I was about sixth grade, he kind of stopped beating me, but then emotionally just started tearing me apart. And my freshman year in high school, my father was diagnosed with cancer. And this was bittersweet for me because part of me was glad because I thought this would come to an end. The other part of me was devastated because it's all I ever knew. It was still my dad. And from that point on, he was diagnosed when I was a freshman in high school. He passed away when I was a freshman in college. In those four or five years, I saw someone, this, this, this monster, become someone who was desperately and passionately in love with Christ. And I can say that I didn't trust that it was real. I didn't believe that it was real for a while. And just over time, he started to show me by his actions and just who he was that he had completely been transformed. There'd be nights I would come home and he never wanted to go to the hospital, so his bedroom became a hospital. And there were nights I would come home and he would fall asleep and I was making sure his IV was good and, and his, he'd be asleep with his face in the Word and I would put the Bible on his bedstand and kind of tuck him in and he'd wake up and we'd start having these conversations hours into the night. And every time he would always, somewhere in the conversation, he would be in tears saying, I'm so sorry for what I did to you and I wish I could change it and take it back. And what I didn't realize at the time I realized it later that he was changing it at that moment. He was showing me what a godly man could be. So much so that to, by the time that he passed away, he is still to this day one of the godliest men that I've ever known. And I say this to say that it put me on this war path with, for the gospel. Because I truly believe I was blessed to see this because if the gospel could change that dude, it would change anybody. And so over the years, like I said, my wife was my first girlfriend in seventh grade, and we, we've got five amazing kids. We've been married for almost 17 years, and, and uh, over, the, uh, over the years, we have seen our fair share of tragedy. At some point, we decided we'd go to grief counsel. We met this godly woman that, that really just kind of showed us how to deal with this stuff, and the first thing she said to me was, we need to go back and visit your past, your childhood, and I was like, nope, didn't sign up for that. She's talking about how I had a bad Tuesday. Let's not go there. And we started to unpack all this stuff, and I realized that, man, I messed up. <laughs> but God has, has gotten a hold of me, and praise God, and allow me to see some amazing things that I can overcome this, because I've learned from the bottom of my heart that I believe there's nothing too big for our Jesus. And during that, she told me, you know what? If you ever want to see what, a God, what you would have been growing up in a godly family environment, just watch your middle son, Charlie, because he's just like you. And I was like, I started bawling. I don't even know why I was crying. Maybe because she accused us of being a godly family environment because I never thought that happened. <laughs> but we did it. <laughs> and Charlie thinks I'm a creep because I stare at him all the time. <laughs> um, and and it, it got me thinking, man, if I knew back then when I was eight what I know now, how would things be different? So I started writing this song about if I could, if I could sit with the eight-year-old version of me, what would I say? How would things be different? i tell you what I would say, and it's a hard song to write. I couldn't figure it out. I put it off to the last of the album for months and months and months because I couldn't figure it out. And like I said a little bit before, man, about two years ago, my life was turned upside down when I hit the wall realizing that there had to be more than just this religiosity that we get so wrapped up into. That it had to be more than just being good, more than bad, that, that, that somehow I had figured out that grace was missing in my life. It's there the whole time. I just didn't realize it. And so I realized that it's not about my efforts, but the efforts of the cross. And the friend of mine that came into my life two years ago to remind me that I, there's nothing I can do to make Christ love me anymore. The one thing that he actually did that probably changed my life the most is that for two years, he would text me every day the same thing. You are holy, you are righteous, and you are redeemed, and I am for you. And eventually, I started to believe it. Not only did I start to believe that I'm not a bad person trying to be good, but I'm holy as he is holy, that I'm redeemed and righteous, but I also started to believe that he was for me, that he cared. So I figured out what I would say to the eight-year-old version of me. I would tell him he's holy, righteous, and redeemed over and over and over and over and over again. Because if it set my world on fire at the age of 40, how much damage could I have done if I'd understood that at eight? 
And I say all this to say there are a lot of you here that may have, and I don't mean to make light of it, mommy and daddy issues. And you carry this stuff around as if it's something you did wrong. I'm here to tell you, it has never been your fault. And you were made for so much more than all the stuff you've been carrying around. And everything the enemy has told you that you were disqualified and that you've messed up. And if anybody knew what you've gone through, you'd be kicked out of the club. That is not of the gospel. Because your identity is not what you do or what you have done. Your identity is the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead that now dwells inside of you. You're not an abused child. You're a child of the living king. You're not a divorced parent, you're a child of the living king. You're not an alcoholic, you're a child of the living king. And so my prayer is I believe that music can make a difference and I pray that these next three minutes, these little words that rhyme, can maybe lighten the load for some of you tonight. This song is called Dear Younger Me. Oh, you are free indeed. 